Let's ask God to, to touch our hearts by His Spirit. Spirit uh, brings God's Word, reveals the truth of God's Word to us. And so um, let's come hungry. Um, let's lean in and say, God, I want to hear something today. God, I need your help today. God, direct me, lead me today. So if that's you, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your Word. Your Word that is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Lord, we come with reverence thankfulness for your word. Lord, what would life be like without your word? And so, Lord, we, we want to treasure your word. Um, it's not just stories, Lord. It's, it's food for our soul, direction for life. Um, it's the way to abundance, Father God. And, and it reveals who you are, Lord. So, Jesus, help us to see you today. Help us to know your heart today as we gather around your word. And I pray that you would transform us in this moment. As we hear this word, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word. And so may you increase our faith in you this morning through what we hear. And we said, Amen. So James chapter 3 verse 1 to 12 reads the following. Remember, James writes to the church, not to unbelievers. So you can consider this word written personally for you if you are a Christian. He says, not many of you should become teachers my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or we'll take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. This is some strong language. I don't know what you think. It says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. And listen to what he says. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. And remember, he speaks to us, the church. He says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. And I like this analogy. He says, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? What's the answer? No. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? No. Or can a grapevine bear figs? No. And then he says, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So, so James comes at us and he, he gives us a powerful reminder of the strength of our words. And he says, words are more than just letters that we read on pages. Words are more than just sounds that come from our throats. He says, words have the power to bless and words have the power to curse. Think of me, with me, that uh, famous songs, songs that you love, what are they made up by? Words. It's the words that catch our attention. Maybe the tune, but probably more so the words. Famous speeches in history. You think of presidents or people that said speeches. Um, power of words. Movies that we like. We know we've got one-liners. You've got a favorite line from your movie? Hey? It's the power of words. The power of words in a courtroom it can be used as evidence for you or against you. Uh, words are powerful in a job interview. <laughs> it's good to say the right things, eh? not to lie, but to say the right things um, in a job interview. Think about when you get married. What do you do? You say vows to one another. It's the, it's the power of words. And Proverbs 18 actually teaches us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. We've all received those deathly words from people. They said, you were a mistake, you're lazy, you're fat, you're stupid. All of us have had something said against us that actually was a curse against us, and we felt the weight of it. And some of us try to cover it up with a lie. We've heard that lie that says, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never harm me. Who knows that that's rubbish? Sticks and stones can harm me, but words, what, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never harm me. No, words definitely can 
harm us. Hopefully you've been the fortunate recipient of those words. You're loved. You've got a great future ahead of you. You're the best. Well done. Thank you. Who's received those words lately? It's so much better to get those words of life. And you know, I can remember clearly standing here two times when someone cursed me with words. And if I stand here now, it's as if that day is so real right now in the moment when that person said those words to me and how it affected me. And it's happened numerous times. And then I've had other occasions where someone spoke words of life over me. Um, we had a guest speaker with us at, at our church. He actually lived uh, in the area for a while, and he felt called by God. He came from Australia. His name was Pastor David Reedman, and he was really just a great spiritual father figure. And there was just this tenderness about him. And I can remember on two occasions during a, a prayer time in service, he, he came to me, um, and he just gave me words of life. And it was just two words. He says, Andrew, you're a good man. And I don't think anyone, especially the right person saying that to me, had ever been said to me. And I treasured those words of him just saying, Andrew, you're a good man. Just two words. And I, I hold to those words because they nurtured my soul. There was obviously a gap, and those words filled the gap. You know, a while ago, my, my wife taught the kids in Journey Church that words are like toothpaste. That uh, once you let them out... What happens? Can anyone come and put this back in the tube for me? Can anyone? See, and that's the power of words. We think, oh, it's just words. No, no, words are powerful. And, and we, we let words fly off our lips so quickly. And then often we say, oh, no, you know, it was just a joke. Or, you know, I didn't mean what I said. And oftentimes we're sarcastic about these things, but we don't realize how sharp and how hurtful or how helpful our words can actually be. And so James uses three illustrations to convey the power of words. He says it's like a, a riding a horse. Anyone ridden a horse, you put a bit in a bridle, and that horse is a huge beast. You're a lot smaller than it, but just a little tug to the left, and the horse goes to the left. A tug to the right, and the horse goes to the right. He says like a ship. It's got a rudder. It can, it can weigh tons. But in the water, that thing is almost weightless, and, and just a small steering of the steering wheel and the rudder underneath the hull just turns and it can steer the whole ship. That's the power of words. And he says it's like a forest fire. A forest fire is huge, almost unstoppable, but how did it start? It was just a small spark, a little flint or one little cigarette misthrown, and pff, here's a massive forest fire. Think with me how significant words are for God. In the beginning, the earth was formless and void, and God spoke. God said, let there be light. God said this, and God said, and he, he brought these things into being. The power of words all throughout Scripture. Think with me. Sal salvation and faith come through the hearing of the word of preaching. God chose the foolishness of preaching to bring about salvation to the world. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You and I come to know Jesus because we hear about what he did for us, and we respond to it. Think about the power of prayer. What is prayer? Prayer, yes, we pray silently, but many times we pray out loud. It's the, it's the power of words. We pray, we, we worship as we did this morning. There's the gift of prophecy. There's the gift of praying in tongues. These have all got to do with speech. Words are significant. Words are powerful to God. And so you and I should maybe come to grips with how powerful our words can be as well. And, and so James, and he writes to the, the church, and he reminds believers who they are in Jesus. It's a reminder for us, and he says, listen, if there's been the seed of salvation that's been planted in your heart, there's got to be the fruit of your lips as well. The Christians have a different speech. Would you agree with me? Uh, Paul later echoes this in Ephesians. He writes to the church, chapter 4, 22. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Who remembers their old self? Who you used to be before you came to know the love of Christ, to, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the, the new self, the new you. That's what happens in Jesus. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Remember, holiness means different, set apart. Then it says this, verse 29, 
Do not let, it's permission, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up, not for breaking them down according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Who agrees Scripture is quite clear on what should actually be coming out of our mouths. And so as Christians, the new you comes with the new mouth. Let's be reminded, when we were made new through our faith in Christ, it actually came with a new nature. The seed of salvation comes with the fruit of our lips. In James chapter 3, he says, Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? No. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear frigs? Obviously, the answer is no. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. He says, come on, it's quite black and white. He draws a line in the sand. You're either this side or you're that side, but, but your speech has got to be godly. And Luke chapter 6, verse 45, this is what Jesus said. And this is so helpful for us. He says, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. And then here's these famous words of Jesus. He says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In other words, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Last week we, we learned, or the week before, that, that we are not allowed to judge by external appearance. But what we can do is we can easily assess someone by what's coming out of their mouths. Jesus said, out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, so whatever is coming out of someone's mouth is just a pure indication of, hey, that's the condition of their hearts. So if it's bitterness and anger and coarse language, all we know is, oh, there's something wrong with the heart. That, that's, you've got to go to the root issue and say, it's not what's on the outside that's the problem. Don't fix up the bad language. It's like, no, go fix up the broken heart. Because Jesus said, out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's so beautiful to come into contact with someone who's got a sweet speech, a loving speech, and then you realize that's what's in their heart. So, so it's hard to judge, almost impossible to judge by external appearance, but we can make a good assessment of anybody based on the speech that's coming out of their mouths. Because here's the truth. Never forget this. Your mouth, I want to make this personal, your mouth is the billboard of your life telling everybody who you really are. Your mouth is a billboard of your life, and it's telling everybody who you really, really are. And the truth is, like James says, that we can only have one of two tongues, one of two speech. Either you and I are going to have a heavenly speech in a language, or we're going to have a hellish taste to our speech. So, so what does a hellish speech look like? Well, it's going to be someone who gossips. They've always got something to say about somebody else. They'll never comment on themselves because they're fine, but they, they love to skin it and say everything about somebody else. They love to curse people. Instead of encouraging and lift people up, they'll say things that purposefully, it's like a dagger, and they think, if I just say that, then it's just going to feel so good. Words of revenge. People who criticize. It's like, can you ever just lift somebody up? No, they're just going to criticize. It's not constructive, and their speech just brings people down. It's people who, who swear a lot. It's people who use manip manipulative language, controlling language. If you don't do this, then this will happen. And it's words of threat, harsh language, or the worst, complaining. Who knows a complainer? No complainers in Journey Church. Amen? Not allowed. Not allowed. Um, I think it was, who was it? Bill Johnson, Pastor Bill Johnson, I think he said, complaining proves only that you can hear the voice of the devil. It's just like, where does complaining fit in the kingdom of God? It doesn't fit anywhere. And my wife and I sat, we're trying to figure out, what's the word for a person? There's not actually a word in the English dictionary for someone who always just loves to bring the bad news to a conversation. You know that person too? You've just, you're just in good spirits. You're like on the top of the earth. And they'll come and say, did you hear about this? You're like, why? Yes, we, we know things happen in the world, and especially in faith circles. Can I, can I encourage you? I don't know if it's maybe just because I'm pastor and people see me that they just got to like vomit bad news on me. But it's just like, when you come to a faith space, don't be a killjoy. 
if you come to a prayer meeting, don't five minutes before a prayer meeting tell us everything that's going wrong and what happened to this thing and this thing. All you're going to do is dampen the spirits and, and push people's faith down. Say things that will lift people up. And so we, we came across the word on, on, online that actually says people like this are called spiritual vampires. All they do is they just suck life. They, they're sad. They're negative. They complain. It's like, yes, acknowledge the good news, but do you need to share it all the time with everybody? Listen, I'll tell you, there's people that I avoid because of this. <gasps> yes, I do. Because like, why must I put myself in that place where I know that person is always just going to tell me what's going wrong in the world and what's bad and like this headline and that headline. I'm like, I read them myself. Come on, let's, we can choose to move from a hellish speech to a heavenly speech. So a heavenly speech would be one of hope. Come on, keep hope alive. I know it's hard, but come on, let's hope together. I'll hope with you. A language of compassion. Not oh, shame, but genuinely like, wow, man, I feel for this person. And, and vocalize your heart for people. Words that are thoughtful, considerate of others. Not that we just say things, but we think, well, if I say this, how's someone else going to interpret it? How's it going to affect their emotions? So, so watching every word, thinking, I've got to be thoughtful with my words. You know, it's not always um, what you say. It's also how you say things that matter. A speech of thanks. That's like one of the hardest words for us to say. Thanks and sorry. Just say thanks. Every time someone helps you, say thank you. We teach our kids this. A language that is forgiving. A language that is one of rejoicing. Come on, it's always, oh, look at the good news and oh, thank God for this and thank God for this person. And instead of pushing people down, they people of encouragement. Lifting people up. What did, what did Paul say in Ephesians? That it may benefit those who listen. So here's some other scriptures. I'll put three up on the screen for you. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Rejoice always. Not in the good times. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Okay, this has got to do with our language. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So people say, what's God's will for my life? Well, He wants you to speak right. It's part of His will for you. Hebrews 3.13. But encourage one another daily. Find reason, find every opportunity to lift people up every day. Because every Christian needs encouragement, not once a week on a Sunday, but every day. And he said, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, when life gets tough, you and I can get hard as well. But, but if people are coming alongside of us, hey, you're doing a great job. Maybe it wasn't the best, but hey, there's another chance. Well done. You tried. You failed forward at least. Lift people up every day. And I love this. Proverbs 16, 24. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Come on, that, that's like, like honey from your lips is, is, is the power of good speech. And I, I'll share with you, I don't think the individual is with us today. But um, every Sunday before service, we meet at quarter past seven here in the hall with our serve team, everyone who serves on a Sunday. And, and we just encourage one another. It's the goal of the meeting. Come on, we've come early. We've come to serve God and His people this morning. So let's give God our best. We're going to serve God with excellence, earnestness and enthusiasm, and we pray and commit the services to God. Uh, and one Sunday I felt that there was a certain uh, individual on team that had just had a bit of a rough season. And so I thought, I'm going to find a way just to bless them, just to encourage them. And so during pre-meeting, I said, All right, hey, don't you want to come stand in the middle? And I said, I want three people in this circle who know this individual personally to, to tell them in our presence what you value about this person. And it was beautiful. This one said this. And by the second person, the person in the middle was already in tears. And then it was the second person. And then the third person. And the words were genuine affection. It's saying, I like you and I love you because your attitude, your willingness, your this. And what did it do? Yes, it brought that person to tears. But it wasn't tears that were hurting. It was tears that were bringing renewal and refreshing and healing to a hurting soul. Words are like Honey, and so can I encourage you to find every reason not to complain, to watch a hellish tongue, to, to lift up, to praise, to thank, because that's who God's people actually are. So, so here's a question. I want to direct this. I want to make this 
personal. And, and remember I said, this, this message is hard for me because I get it wrong. Uh, I get it wrong with my kids. Can I be honest? When the kids irritate me, it's easy to say the wrong thing in a, in a moment of frustration. I think, oh, why did I say that? That wasn't helpful. And then I could have done it, could have said something better. So, so I'm with you. So let's ask ourselves this question. How do people feel after leaving your presence? After having a conversation with you, in general, are people happy to go or sad to leave? After having a conversation with you, now evaluate yourself. What is your speech? When you have a general conversation with people, what are the things you say? What are the things that you tell people? Out the abundance of the heart, the mouth flows. And then you think, are people happy to leave or sad to go from my presence? I asked my friends this years ago, and it was a wife and, his, uh, a wife and her husband. And I said, well, guys, I want to know, what kind of a person am I? When, I'm, when, I'm, when you're in my presence, how do I affect you? Because they were friends I trusted that they could speak into my life and tell me. And the wife said, no, I don't know. You can ask my husband. He'll rather tell you because she was too scared to say. Maybe I wasn't the encouraging person. This was years ago. But we've got to be vulnerable and say, come on, I know I can do better. I know you can do better. So, so maybe we need some friends to, to help us with our speech. It was Eleanor Roosevelt. She was the wife of... U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt. I love this. She said, great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Read that for yourself. And again, let it just be a self-evaluation. of What do I talk about? What do I actually talk about? Do I talk about great ideas, changing the world, uh, impacting the world with God's kingdom? Do I, do I talk about just events, things that happened this weekend, that weekend, my life, fun? Or do I talk about people and gossip? And it just goes from big to smaller, smaller, smaller. You know, when it comes to talking about people, as Christians, we love to cover it up saying, it's a pastoral concern. I just want to let you know what happened to this person or what I saw. And, and you bring it up thinking, well, if I talk about it, we're going to cover them in prayer. But it's like borderline gossip. Uh, and what I've seen over the years, and this is true, is how you talk about people, especially in their absence, tells me more about you than it does about them. What you tell me about others tells me more about you than what it does about them. And so again, watch your language. If I'm speaking about others, is it genuine concern and love, or is it gossip? Is it encouraging? Is it building? Is it breaking? James says, no human being can tame the tongue. I read that. I feel hopeless. Who's with me? Like, well, is it an ever-losing battle? Is there ever a way around it? And the answer is there is. With a lot of self-effort and a lot of help from the Holy Spirit, you and I can control our tongues. Verse 10, he says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. And he says, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. So he says, listen, there's hope. There's, this is a call to correct the problem, it's not impossible. You and I actually can watch our mouths. Remember the seed of salvation? If we truly belong to Christ Jesus, if, if he's given us a new nature, it comes with a new tongue, a new kind of language, the things we say and the things we don't say. And so our tongues can only be tamed when God touches our hearts. Never forget that the love of Christ is a transforming power. The good news doesn't leave us the same. The good news, encountering Jesus Christ, submitting our lives to him, believing in him, comes with a transforming power. It changes who we are. That's why, why Paul spoke so clearly about our old way of life and the, the new you, because Christ transforms us. So, so no Christian can be with excuse. Well, some, well, they can control their tongue, but I can't. No, you can, because God's power is there for you. And I think it's quite, I don't know, let's just say scary. This verse, Jesus, Matthew chapter 12, um, Jesus says, But I tell you that for every careless word that people speak, they will give an account on it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Jesus says for every careless word. Now, I'm 39 years old. I'm thinking, how many careless words have I uttered in 39 years that Jesus will hold me accountable for? 
every careless word, and again, so many times, years ago I was a youth leader, and uh, I found what was happening on Friday nights. I was obviously a bit older than most of the youth, and so I had some experience, some maturity that came with me. And I found the kids were being sarcastic with each other a lot. And like, I love sarcasm, okay? Don't trust the man without a sense of humor, for sure. But, but I watched the sarcasm. A lot of it was an underlying, like, they're actually trying to, like, maybe hurt the person. So I had to address it, and I think there was a certain individual. I said, hey, man, just, just slow down on the sarcasm. Slow down on the joking, because you think it's funny. And everyone's going, ha, 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 but the person in the circle is, like, not actually laughing with you, because they're saying, that's the truth. That hurts me. And so we've, we've got to be considerate with our language, because Jesus says, for every careless word, you and I. Who's just like, I'm not going to say anything anymore. Jesus come. You know, in World War II, there was this phrase coined, loose lips sink ships. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you've heard of it. But, but this was um, a campaign that was aimed at civilians, but also at those serving in the army, the servicemen, to avoid any careless talk. They said, don't utter any information that may undermine our war efforts, because loose lips may sink ships. So if you let out some information, a spy could be in the room, you don't know, and it could be sent back to the enemy lines, and they could come back and kill us for it. So they said, during wartime, don't let anything careless be said. Watch what you say about the war efforts. And who agrees that we are in a war of our own? We have an enemy, and we should not give him the victory through our speech. We don't be careless with our words. We're going to watch every word. Why? Because we're allies with God. We're not his enemies. We partner with God, and we speak how God would speak. And so I love friendship with the Holy Spirit. Do you know that benediction? It's a verse. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. So fellowship with the Holy Spirit means friendship. You should, your best friend should be the Holy Spirit. Sit on that. He should be the one that you speak to all the time, every day. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Lead me, Holy Spirit. Help me, Holy Spirit. What do I say, Holy Spirit? How are you, Holy Spirit? Praise you, Holy Spirit. Fellowship, friendship with the Holy Spirit. Imagine being friends with someone, George and our friends. Imagine we hang out in each other's company for 12 hours and say nothing. It's an odd friendship. Like, talk. No, no, fellowship is talking. And, and I love the fact that I get to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has given me some of the best advice with my words. There'll be times and spaces where he says, Andrew, speak up. You need to say something. Either it's a, a word of correction, a word of encouragement, whatever it is. I'm, I don't want to say it. He says, speak up. And then there's times the Holy Spirit, and I love it when he says this, and he's protected me so many times. I'm sure he's done it with you as well. When he's coming, he says, Andrew, shut up. Andrew, don't say a thing. You know when you're... Oh. And then the Holy Spirit says, no, shh, 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 shh. Don't, don't say that now. Because you know, and I know, that if that comes out your mouth, it's going to hurt. And for me, I've learned that it's not always what I say, but it's who I am that says it. Sometimes my, my, just because of my calling and who I am, if I bring the word, it's maybe a bit harsher than someone else saying it. And so the Holy Spirit has often helped me just to say, Andrew, shut up. In a conversation, I've got an opinion. Who knows that because you have an opinion, it mustn't be aired. <laughs> just because you think something doesn't mean you have to say it. Sometimes just keep your opinion to yourself. So the Holy Spirit will give you the advice to either speak up or shut up. But I think our goal should be the heart of David. You know the verse so well. And he says to God, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. God, may what comes out of my mouth, everything I say, may it be pleasing. May what I say bring a smile and not a frown to your face. Help me to, if I were like Jesus, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? Well, Jesus doesn't curse. He doesn't complain. He doesn't moan. He doesn't criticize. He doesn't threaten. He doesn't manipulate. So Jesus, that's not me. And maybe if that's you, today's the day you say, hey, God, help me to stop that. Because listen, you're going to be held accountable. And if you're guilty, you're going to lose out. See, but if there'll be blessings and rewards for those who get it right. 
I want to I want to skip any sort of judgment that's unnecessary. If it's in my power, James says it should not be, brothers and sisters. So with a lot of self-effort, a lot of help from the Holy Spirit, you and I could move from maybe having a bit of a hellish language to having a heavenly language that would build up and help and praise God. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Remember, it's like toothpaste, eh? Once it's out, there's no getting it back. No getting it back. So let, let's make sure that what comes out is the good stuff. Amen. Let's pray. I want you to sit on this. This is personal. I can tell you every day, I say, God, help me with my speech. God, it's so easy to, to say things that break people. It's sometimes saying the wrong thing makes me feel good, which is evil. <laughs> I shouldn't want to hurt someone so that I can feel good. I shouldn't want to control someone because that just shows there's a great weakness within myself. I think, church, let's be honest. As I said, this word is not for some, but for, for all of us. And so can we draw humbly near to God right now? Humbly before Him. And ask for help. Maybe you had a bad conversation in the car <laughs> before you got to church today. Maybe you said something last night. Listen, it was so beautiful. Can I tell you, while, we, while you're just praying, sitting on this, the power of words, the significance of them for, for God. I think it's in the book of James. We'll probably read it toward the end of the, the series. It says, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. God says, you need to tell people aloud about some of the wrong things you've done. And only then, when you bring it from the light into, from the dark into the light, that's when your soul will be healed. Yesterday was so beautiful. Maria and I received a message from someone that uh, we've lost contact with and, and something terrible happened years ago. And, and you know what? They just held onto this guilt for so many years and it's been robbing them of peace and joy and purpose. And this person found the courage yesterday to send Maria and I a long message just to confess and to say what they did wrong and, and they apologize if it um, hurt or offended us in any way and listen it didn't really but I know it, it held them captive but I'm so grateful it was for their sake they found the words to, to get it out of their heart to say I'm sorry and I can tell you this morning that, word, that person woke up different the power of words either said or written carry power We can build up, we can break down. Maybe some of us simply today need to repent. Repent is simply to turn. I was going this direction, but I'm turning a complete about face, 180 degree, and I'm going in a different direction. I used to be a husband or an individual that would swear, curse, manipulate at my wife, my children, my employees. But today you say, you recognize my identity in Christ that's not who I am. And maybe, listen, Jesus said, out the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's because you aren't truly found in Christ. Your nature has not been changed. And you're desperate. You say, Jesus, I need you. I want your spirit to transform me. And I pray that the power of God would touch you right now. That you would be hungry and humble and say, Lord, that's me. I need the finger of God to touch my heart. Come on, whatever you're feeling, bring it to God right now. He's a God that loves. He's not here to condemn. He's here to correct in love. God's not going to push you down. God's going to lift you up. God's not going to remind you of your past. He's going to tell you what your future is. He's going to speak a heavenly, loving, encouraging language and future over you. Lord, we just thank you for your great love. Lord, we thank you for your word that comes strong. But we know it's only strong because you want to help us, God. Thank you, Lord, that it's not impossible to tame the tongue. That we can, with a lot of determination and effort and help by the Holy Spirit, most importantly, 
we can change the way we speak. So God, we, we ask for help today as a church. Help us not to be the ones that just spoil conversations with bad news. <laughs> help us to find good things to say and encouragements and testimonies to bring. Let us be the light of the world with our lips, God. And I want to pray for you this morning. Maybe say, Andrew, I need my nature changed. Listen, coming to... Coming to church does not mean you're close to Christ. There's a point where you and I surrender our hearts. We, we realize our need for Jesus. And we give up our lives. We surrender. We say, Jesus, I believe that what you did on the cross was true. Make me new. Give me a fresh start, Jesus. Thank you that you wash my sin white as snow. Your spirit touches my broken spirit, makes me whole, makes me new, sets my foot in a new direction. Forgives me of all the things that I've said and done and thought before. Listen, if that's you today, nobody's watching. It's a moment of respect. It's between you and I. If today you, you feel you need to cross that line, and truly become a Christ follower, I would love to pray for you. If you'd raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, God. That your spirit is with us. Your spirit is ministering to us, Lord. Lord, we sense your presence. We love the warmth of your presence. Lord, we thank, thank you for your loving correction. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation, that, that we don't earn it. We celebrate it in communion. You gave us salvation in your great love for us, God. Help us to just receive your love. And so, Lord, for, for every person responding this morning, you know them better than what I ever will, God. You created them in your image. You know where they stand. And Lord, I pray that you would meet them at their place of need. Help them to acknowledge their need for you, Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that as your word says, that we would repent, that we would turn, be baptized, and follow Jesus for the rest of our days. May this be true for someone in this room, maybe more than one, starting today. We pray in the wonderful name. Of Jesus. And we said, Amen. So, so look at the person next to you and say something good about them. You see, the hugs just flow. You can't say something bad about someone and hug them. I want you to think about that, that the earth was formless and void and God spoke. God didn't by skill and power and strength, fashion the earth with his hands like a builder. No, the power of words. You and I create stuff. You and I break stuff. And not just stuff. Let me say people through our words. And, and why don't we make it our own like project to, that wherever we go, man, if it's a car guard, say, thank you for your service. Um, if there's someone in church, I love to comment. I just, I, I like how people look. I appreciate that and how people smell as well. So, so if a guy or a girl comes to me, I'm like, I like your cologne or your perfume is nice. Or did you have a haircut today? What am I doing? I'm affirming them. I'm saying, hey, I like your new shoes. I see them because you bought them so we could see them. So I see them. They look nice. Don't go, oh, look at them. No, come on. Every, every opportunity to lift up, do it. And you know what? Whatever a man sows, he who wants that language back at them? It's quite simple. And so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship, the one who tells us to shut up and the one who tells us to speak up, be with us all. Amen.